It's Halloween in 2012, and Hurricane Sandy has rendered a terrible impact on the U.S. Northeast. And so today, in lecture number eight, I want to talk about natural disaster economics and briefly talk about some lessons that I hope we all learn and debate from Hurricane Sandy. So we all know that October 29th was an ugly day, and the Northeast is still digging out. A few economics ideas. In a well-known paper by Jordan Rappaport and Jeff Sachs, in the Journal of Economic Growth, they documented that more and more Americans and more and more economic activity is clustering on the coasts of the United States, on the East Coast and the West Coast. So in a world of sea level rise, and I take climate change quite seriously, and uh, ongoing natural disasters such as hurricanes and floods that may be exacerbated by climate change, we're putting more people and more economic assets in harm's way raises an economics and an engineering issue. How do we defend coastal areas and who pays? So to be precise here, think of the taxpayers in South Dakota. They pay taxes. Why, if you're from South Dakota, you might ask, why is a chunk of the money that you pay in taxes being used to fortify the coasts of the U.S. that mainly benefits the people who choose to live there? We all understand that things like the military are national public goods, but why is coastal protection a national public good rather than a state and local public good that should be financed out of state and local budgets? I pose that as a provocative question. I'm not claiming that redistribution is bad, but there's both efficiency and equity implications of how we set up disaster relief, and I think that Hurricane Sandy will lead to some discussion of these issues. Now there's two ways to battle a natural disaster. You can take precautions before the case, before the event, and you can take, uh, and then you can clean up the mess afterwards. Folks, as I understand it, the roughly 50 people who died under in Hurricane Sandy, most of them died from falling tree limbs. Is it a law of physics that people have to die from falling tree limbs? Of course not you get into interesting issues of tree trimming, a topic that I don't believe economists have published a paper on, but the economics is simple. If you own a tree, that's a beautiful thing, but a, it's potentially a deadly weapon because of the laws of physics, a big heavy branch that could snap off. In a well-functioning world, uh, tree owners would recognize the damage in expected value that their trees could pose and would hire tree trimmers. It is costly to hire them, but to bring in tree trimmers to trim them. I believe in many neighborhoods there's an element of citizens not engaging in their civic responsibility. Perhaps they face the wrong incentives to do so. A, if more households invested in costly tree trimming, many fewer people would have died in Hurricane Sandy. This raises an issue of liability and how we incentivize tree owners to take proper precautions. A second issue that we've learned in Hurricane Sandy is the placement of urban infrastructure. Why is Wall Street in southern Manhattan in a flood-prone area? Should it continue to be there in the face of climate change, which raises the risk of flooding in this area? For the many buildings and Con Edison buildings that had key generators in their basements and in flood-prone areas, why are they there? I understand historical inertia is a reason for why they have been there, but why will, will they continue to be there? Will we repeat our mistakes again? So the point of this slide is if we took more ex-ante precautions, we will suffer less damage from the next natural disaster. And we need to design incentives to encourage those who, whose choices, whether it's tree trimming or where to place urban infrastructure, have implications when a natural disaster strikes. Now, an important issue that's going to be debated, and we see Governor Chris Christie on the national news uh, hungry for a FEMA bailout of the New Jersey coast, after a natural disaster takes place, it's human nature to support a large transfer of redistribution to the affected area. We see those suffering, we feel sorry for them, and FEMA steps in, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. But a quick debate, are there unintended consequences of FEMA's well-meaning actions? When South Dakota taxpayers' dollars go to the New Jersey coast to rebuild it, that's other people's money. And the people of New Jersey and the leadership in New Jersey may not may choose to simply rebuild New Jersey the way it was. I want you to think of a counterfactual. What if New Jersey had to spend its own money for rebuilding New Jersey and knew that it wouldn't receive any federal money when disasters occur? 
My economic logic tells me that if New Jersey could only spend its own taxpayer dollars on restoring itself, it would build a more robust, resilient New Jersey with fewer people living in the coast and zoning and setting up incentives to build assets near the coast that are more resilient to natural disasters. So the moral hazard effect here is you take more risk when you are implicitly insured. The anticipation that there'll be a national bailout of affected areas reduces ex-ante precautions. You're more likely to smoke in bed if you know that if your house burns down, you're going to get insurance. To not economists, this may sound harsh, but this is just responding to incentives. When you spend your own money and you know you're on the hook for any damage that occurs, you take more precautions ex-ante and we suffer less when disasters occur. Lessons from Hurricane Sandy I hope there's a silver lining of this horrible natural disaster, that we start to build and adapt as we realize that these shocks could become more typical. We, if we're going to continue to live in coastal areas, we need to create incentives to create a more resilient housing stock and to take actions to minimize uh, deadly things like falling tree branches. Let me end with an example from NYU, New York University's hospital. They had to evacuate the hospital, all these newborn babies and sick people, because not only did Con Edison's power black out, but their own backup power generators blacked out and didn't work, and there was no power. The question is, how could the backups break down? Why were the backups perhaps in the basement of that hospital? We need resilient backup plans uh, to have this fail-safe system of, of checks so that if the system-wide grid breaks down, at crucial piece of infrastructure, we have backup plans in place. And I hope that, this silver, that a silver lining of this disaster is that this lesson has been learned. And I just hope that no one in that NYU hospital suffered too much as power was unexpectedly lost.